Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church, Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us for Heart of Worship, Praising the Risen King, as we take a glance into Revelation. Hope you enjoy today's lesson. You know, when you really study the Bible, it's uh, really good for about two chapters, and then we mess it up. And in the last two chapters, God makes everything new. And in between, it's kind of a a mess of sin and repentance and grace and teaching and everything else. And I always kind of found it interesting that we don't know a lot about our eternity, right? We know a lot about what's happened in the past and we know it about now, but as far as the eternity, we get two chapters. <laughs> so what are we going to be doing for all eternity? That's a long time to think about. We got two chapters to describe it, some chapters in some other places. And I was, think, I was thinking about that and I, I was thinking, you know, well, perhaps... Even if the Lord told us, we couldn't understand it because it's so good, he said, that our minds can't comprehend what eternity is going to be like. So we get a little glimpse in here because God chose to give Jesus a revelation that he would give, or the angel would give to John, and then John would give to the churches, and it's passed down to us. And we're going to look at our future here. Now, before we get started, I think thinking about heaven and thinking about our future is something that can bring us a lot of hope here on earth. It's something that we probably ought to be doing throughout our days, right? Especially on those tough, long days of serving God that are tired and uh, tiring and difficult and it's hot outside and all that. It's, it's good to think about one day, this is all going to be over. One day I'll never have to get out of bed on Monday morning, drag my body to work. One day I'll never have another test or trial or I'll never have any more pain or crying or tears and all this will be over. Now, on the flip side of that, some people really don't want to go to heaven right now because they've got things on the earth they still want to do. And some of that is God putting things in your heart to do to serve him. But, you know, the Apostle Paul said, I would rather depart right now and go be with Jesus than stay here. But I need to stay here and it's necessary for me to stay here for you to help you in your faith. Spurgeon said that whatever um, keeps you from saying, come Lord Jesus, come right now, Lord Jesus, it's probably an idol in your heart. So think about that. Meditate on that a little bit. What, what, am I, what do I actually think is going to be better than Jesus and being in his presence? We're probably deceived because being with him forever is going to be so much better than anything we can look forward to on earth. So to purify our hearts and purify our minds, let's think about, hey, you know, Lord, what do you have coming for us? And can I look forward to that every day? And Should I be looking forward to that? Should I be dwelling on that? It's a good thing for our mind to dwell on. Amen. We're commanded to dwell on things that bring praise and things that are good and holy. And a lot of times our mind has just gone, what do I need to do next? You know, we get upset about things. We even get angry about things. We react to our trials in a non-biblical way. And we, we get frustrated throughout our days sometimes. And and if you're like me, I have conversations with people in my head. This is what I'm going to say to them. And it, we just get ourselves worked up about a stuff that really doesn't matter, right? Well, God is testing us throughout our days. He's testing us throughout our life. But I think dwelling on the Word of God, Genesis 2, Revelation, but also what we're going to look at today, dwelling on our future, dwelling on our eternal home is going to give us great joy. Now, as you grow older, you'll find yourself looking more and more forward to this, I can tell you. I find myself, you know, I'm 50, what am I, 56? I uh, never know how old I am. Uh, I find myself each year looking more and more forward to heaven because the body is just breaking down more and more. I realize more and more the things I thought were great on this earth are not so great. And heaven's going to be so much better than this place. Looking forward to being with people that are already there, like my grandparents. Looking forward to seeing them as I walk through the gates and all that. So, hey, we've got a great future, y'all, and we can be encouraged as we look at God's Word. So let's, let's look at chapter 21 and 22. All's well that ends well for us, for believers. Chapter 21 of Revelation. Then I saw, this is John, a new heaven and new earth. When did he see this? After everyone whose name is not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. All unbelievers are now gone. They're all in the lake of fire. This is after the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. This is after the great white throne of judgment where we'll all be judged and all our works will be exposed and judged. Then everyone whose name is not in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. So we're all that's left. Believers are all that's left. 
And he sees a new heaven and a new earth. Why? For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. A lot in this verse here. Okay? This earth that we live in will not last forever. Christ will come, will remodel it for the thousand year reign, but a remodel is not a totally new thing. The totally new thing comes in 21.1. Now, a whole new earth. Now, this will be our eternal home. This earth is not the home of righteousness. This earth is going to have God's wrath poured out upon it because the people that are living in it were extremely evil and doing things to God's people that were horrible. In fact, I'll say this. If you study Revelation, probably the most evil generation to come in world history is the generation at the end times. They will be getting plagues upon them. God trying to call them to repentance, judging them for killing us and slaughtering us worldwide, and they will still curse God for their sores, for the plagues, everything He's doing. Those, the, says they don't repent of their immorality. They don't repent of, of anything. As God is judging them, they're just looking back at Him and cursing Him. They kill us worldwide. And you know, you can blame the leaders, you can blame the Antichrist, and you can blame the false prophet and all that, but... You know what? Leaders have to have followers. Did Hitler do what he did without followers? Do you get 50 million unborn children killed in our country without followers? Leaders have to have followers. So this generation to come is going to be the generation that gets God's wrath poured out upon the earth. And listen, here's the deal. When you look at the end times, it's very kind of similar to what God did to Israel. So here's Israel at the end times, at the end of their time, at the end of Judah, when Babylon comes and destroys them. And that generation that Jeremiah lived with, were they a repentant generation? Were they nice people? No, they were, again, one of the worst generations in Israel's history, and God chose to pour out His wrath on them in the destruction of Jerusalem in their time. And I think you see a similar thing in Revelation. Look, y'all, when you read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and you just don't read it devotionally, you just don't read it to say, oh, what can I get out of this verse today for me? When you start reading chapter after chapter after chapter, you're going to see patterns. You're going to see God reveal himself to you in the patterns and the ways that he acts in history. You're going to see things that, that God shows you as you study the word, as you become a student of it. And there are patterns in the scripture, just like God pours out his wrath on, on that generation in 587 B.C. in Judah that just totally rejects him and does all this stuff to Jeremiah and won't repent. Even though Babylon's right outside the gates, they still won't repent you're going to see a similar evil generation at the end of this world. And it's going to get the wrath of God poured out upon them. Now, did we all deserve it at some point in time? Yes, but God is gracious. He's merciful. He is a God of grace, right? But nevertheless, He is a God of holiness and justice too. And we see in Revelation His justice being poured out through the plagues, through the wrath of God being poured out on those who have the mark of the beast and what they do to us. We remember, we won't be able to buy, sell, anything. So if it were to happen in our lifetime, I'd run to Jeremiah, since he can grow things. I'd say, <laughs> let's go out to the country somewhere. Let's, let's figure out a place to hide, and let's start some little vegetable garden somewhere, right, Jeremiah? Well, God gives us someone else. <laughs> you already got the place lined up. We wouldn't love the tribulation, trust us. Trust me, I'm making a joke. Probably shouldn't joke about that too much, but, you know, it's okay to laugh. So, um, this earth will be gone. The heavens will be gone. The stars, everything that he created is going to be gone. And all that will be left is the throne of judgment and us standing before God. And then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, this earth, new earth is going to be pretty cool. It's going to be the home of righteousness, the Bible says. This new earth. And there is a city on this earth that we're going to look at that is unbelievable. This city on this earth, besides being a huge and massive city and the biggest city ever, it's going to be a place where God dwells and He dwells with us. So let's, let's check it out. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them as their God. Boom, right there. That's enough for me. That's enough for me. God's going to come live with us. We're going to dwell with Him. God is going to 
come down, bring his heaven down. He's bringing heaven to this new earth, and we are going to live with God. We'll have perfect intimacy with God. We'll see Jesus face to face. We'll understand him completely and how we understand the part. We'll understand and know him completely. We won't have a sinful nature anymore. We won't have the flesh anymore. And we'll have perfect, unbroken communion with God. That's heaven right there. All the crystals and the gold and everything else, that's, that's lesser than what we get right here. The dwelling place of God is with man. Now we had the tabernacle in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit dwells in us now. God is with us. Yes, he's everywhere, but that's not what it's talking about. Moses couldn't even see God. He had to see the back of God, right? He couldn't even see God's face. We will see perfectly. We will see God's face perfectly. We will know him in a way that we've never known him before. Again, quoting Spurgeon, he said that the, the youngest child, the smallest child that's in heaven, has more knowledge of Jesus now than the whole, all of the ministries in the world combined. Amen. Stop and think about that. The youngest child who's now in heaven has more knowledge of him, should humble us, than all the ministries in the world combined. That's what awaits us. Knowledge of God. Knowing him fully. And we won't have to seek him anymore. We won't have to fast and pray and do our spiritual disciplines anymore because it will be there. It will be full and, and complete. And there'll be no more striving in us to have to seek God and deal with our flesh and be rebuked by him. And, oh, it's going to be wonderful. But now, if we want to know God here, we're also going to have to know the sharing in his sufferings. This is something Paul wanted to do. I talk about it a lot because it's contrary to our American culture and American Christianity. But Paul said, I want to know the fellowship of the sufferings. So if you really want to seek God here, if you want to fast and pray and study the word, read the word every day, then you're going to suffer. Maybe more than you would if you don't, because knowing Jesus will hurt your heart sometimes, right? You're going to get persecuted. The things that bother God are going to bother you. You hear someone take the Take the Lord's name in vain, and it, instead of just blowing it off, it actually bothers you when you hear that. It bothers you to hear and see the things in the world. But here, knowing God, verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither the, shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. God is renewing his creation. There is a whole new start over. He's making all things new, he says. Look at verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Wow, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to a new body. It's eternal. It doesn't hurt. I'm looking at all things being made new. No more evil in the world. Evil will be no more. Sin will be no more. There'll be no more anger and frustration inside of me in the flesh. There'll be no more impatience. All things will be made new. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no crying or tears or, or anything else because God will make everything new. He'll completely renew his creation. So it is paradise regained in some ways even better than, than Eden. And he says, write this down. Remember, John is writing this stuff down. He's seeing. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give, give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who overcomes will have this inheritance. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We looked at the second death last week. And here again in verse 8, you see the necessity of repentance. That your lifestyle shows where you're going. That real faith has real works. Now, wait a minute. We're all at times don't have faith. We all at times are maybe ashamed of Jesus or the words of God or the gospel. We all at times, according to Jesus, had lustful thoughts and commit sexual immorality in our mind or with our bodies. So what is this saying here? This is saying, like I've taught y'all before, that there's a difference between struggling with sin and living in sin. Unbelievers live in sin. Christians struggle with sin. We're going to struggle till the day we die. Here it's describing people who are unrepentant. They're cowardly. They, don't, they want to go with the crowd instead of being identified with Jesus. They're ashamed of him, right? They're, they don't have faith. 
They're faithless. They don't have faith. They do detestable things. They commit murder. They live uh, with someone they're not married with. Sexual immorality. Sorcery. Idolatry. They're liars. Uh, have you told a lie? We've all probably told the liar to see, but this is the habit of their lifestyle. Their whole life is a bait and switch and their company or whatever. You know, they call you on the phone, say that they're IRS and try to steal your money. They're liars. That's what they do for a living. They lie. That's how they get income. That's how they exist. So these people who are unrepentant, who live this unrepentant lifestyle, will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will be thrown in the lake of fire. But what if you say, well, but you know, but I, I saw them walk the aisle. I saw them. So what? I saw them ask Jesus in their heart. So what? Look at their actions. Look at their life. You know a tree by its fruit. Look, look and see if they're living in sin. If they're living in sin, you better pray for them. You better encourage them to repent because the scripture will not be broken. You will not break the word of God. You won't be the one exception who gets to live with her boyfriend or girlfriend and then go to heaven. You're not going to be the exception, okay? So look at the word of God, take it for what it says, and pray for people. Then came, verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, this angel says to John, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. We looked at this eternal wedding. Nobody will be married in heaven except the church and Christ. It is the eternal marriage. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Its radiance was like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. Honor to the 12 tribes there on the gates. And on the east, three gates. And the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. Is this an actual city? Yes, it is. It is more of a city than Houston is, because Houston is temporary. It says in Revelation, all the cities of the earth will be destroyed at one time. All the cities fell. And a great worldwide earthquake as God judges the world for what they did to us, cutting off our heads and killing us. I know you probably love Houston, but Houston ain't eternal. Neither is the United States, by the way. But this is, this is the city that will last forever. This is our home. This is where we'll live. This is where Jesus is going to provide a, prepare a place for you. There's a place for you there. This is your home. Abraham saw it, the scripture says. You know, he lived in tents. God gave him a vision of it. God also gave Abraham a vision of Christ. He saw his day and was glad. When you walk with God, it's amazing what he shows you. John sees it. He's probably the first person to see it in such great detail. He gets to tell us what it looks like. Tell the church throughout the ages, this is your home. This is where you're going. This is where you belong. This is what you were created for. You weren't created for this place. You were created to serve in this place and serve God here and, God, and glorify and honor God. But for eternity, think about eternity. Oh, we, I mean, we've just been on this earth for a little while, right? Just a little while. I mean, eternity is like you go down to Galveston and look at the beach or go to any beach. And eternity, compared, this life is like a grain of sand. One grain of sand compared to eternity. It's going to be a long, long time. Never end. So all of our suffering, all of our trials here, just one grain of sand on the beach of eternity. we got a lot of time with the Lord to look forward to, y'all. Unbroken fellowship, and we're going to look at this city some more. So the wall of the city had 12 foundations. So it's got a wall around it. Okay, The city has a wall around it. And it, the wall has 12 foundations. So it's like, so we have one foundation, you know, this has 12 foundations built up. And on them, on the, each of the foundations was the, were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we see the 12 tribes over the gates. And on the foundation, you see the name of the 12 apostles. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold. So this angel has a measuring rod to measure things. And he's going to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Now, we don't get the measurement of the gates, but we do get the measurement of the city and the walls. So why is this angel measuring the city for John? Because God wants to know how big this city is. He wants us to know what it looks like. 
He, we don't, he didn't have to tell us this, but he is. He measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurements, which is also an angel's measurements. That's kind of an interesting statement. <laughs> the human measurement is also in the angel measurement here. And, and he measures it with this rod so that John can see, can tell John how big this city is. So this is about, I think, 144 cubits is something like 75 yards thick of a city, something like that. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's a thick wall that surrounds the city. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. Let me tell you something. Uh, when they study, you study this passage, we've never really seen this kind of gold on earth. Gold that is clear as glass. So you'll be able to see through things. <laughs> well, wait a minute, I like my privacy. You won't need, you won't need it there. It'll be clear, <laughs> pure gold. <laughs> the foundations of the wall of the city, okay, foundations of the wall, were adorned with every kind of jewel, the first jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, uh, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth tro topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh uh, jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. John must have knew his crystals there, or God revealed it to him, showing him what they were. Uh, these are what the foundations, I believe, are made of. This is the twelve foundations. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So yeah, you'll be walking on it. It'll be like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So at this point, we're not going to have churches in the New Jerusalem. The whole place will be church. This will be our church. You don't like church? You don't like going to church? Well, I don't know if you're going to like heaven, because heaven's going to be church every day. Even better. That's our future. That's our home. Now, he sees no temple here, but I thought there was a heavenly temple, right? At one time, remember? In heaven? Temple in heaven? He doesn't see that here. New heaven and new earth. Just throwing it out there. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is the Lamp. Wow. So there's no need for a sun or moon here. There's no need for you to turn on a light bulb. What illuminates this city? God does. The glory of God. Jesus and his powerful glory completely illuminates and lights up. I think it's going to be pretty bright, don't you? Now there is a spiritual light that you can actually see, I believe, at times. Did you know that? Did you know that when God created the world, before he created the sun and the moon, he said, let there be light? So there was light before he created the sun and the moon. Interesting, right? There's no sun or moon here, but there's light. I remember one Wednesday night in a former church where I ministered, we were, I was with the young adults on Wednesday night. We had our little Bible study and we had prayer time and the Holy Spirit really just moved and fell on us during the prayer time. And we were interceding for the church, interceding for our service Sunday and praying for the God's presence and just crying out to him. It was just a special night. That next Sunday, worship was unbelievable. It was just incredible. And I noticed the place was a lot brighter. It just was. And afterwards, one of the young adults who was in, the, in our prayer meeting, with, she came up to me and goes, wasn't it bright in there today? She saw it too. We saw the light of the glory of God. Jesus said you can walk in the light. You ever feel like you're walking in darkness? You can walk in the light. The, the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. By its light will the nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Wait a minute, kings of the earth? So there is a new earth. And there's just not a city, right? The city is on the earth. It's probably going to be a pretty big earth. So we look at the size of the city here. Yeah. 2116. The city lies four square. Its length is the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod. 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height were equal. They say everything's bigger in Texas, right? But it's not. <laughs> everything's bigger in heaven. This thing right here is the biggest city in the history of the world. You know how big 12,000 stadia was? About 1,400 miles. That's about here to D.C. Ever taken that drive? It's a big city. That's how wide it is and how deep it is. It's also, and now we can maybe a little understand that a little bit, a massive, huge city like that, but it's also how high this city is. You know, our atmosphere is like 60 miles or something like that, but we're in officially space. Can you imagine 1,400 miles up as well as 
this square. Now people have drawn this as a cube, like, kind of like a skyscraper. And I've also seen it drawn as a mountain. I actually like the mountain drawing a little better because it reminds me of the old Jerusalem, the mountain of God. And it fulfills some of these prophecies that it's 1,400 one miles high of a mountain on this huge earth that kind of goes up to God. Either way, it's the most massive city the world has ever seen. It'll be on this. Why is this city so big? Why does God make this city so huge? Every believer from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, will have a place there, including me, including you. You'll have a place in the city. I'm looking forward to a house that doesn't have things to break down. Perfect weather every day. Perfect food, too. All right, no, so this place is going to be incredibly huge. In fact, it's hard for us even to imagine a city that big, right? Wow, what a, what a joy to explore this thing and go meet everybody that's ever lived from the beginning of time. Samuel will be there. Abraham will be there. Moses will be there. Do you think we'll get to talk to them? Of course we will. We'll get to talk to Jesus. What about your great-great-great-great-grandfather? Will be there? Yeah, you get to meet your ancestors. Oh, you'll get to meet the people that come after you as well. Your nieces and nephews and all the people in future generations will all be home with the Lord. I'm looking forward to meeting some of these guys from the Old Testament. David, Jeremiah, oh, Elijah. Some people even theorize that they'll be wearing their clothes from their time period. Beautiful city. Well, wait a minute, I like the country. I don't really like cities. You're going to have an earth too that has gates that you're going to go in and out of, right? There's no reason for a gate if you can't go in and out of it, right? So I'll get to finally climb mountains because these feet and these knees can't do it. I'll get to, oh, it's going to be a wonderful city. Amazing earth, home of righteousness. Perfectly see God going in and out of our city and have our home and maybe go into country. And There's no sea there, though. No sea. But it doesn't say there won't be water, fresh water, rivers and things like that. In fact, there is a river. We'll look at it in just a second. And probably other rivers and lakes as too. Well, we know. Uh, its gates will never be shut by day or night. We don't need to shut the gates. Back then they had to shut the gates for safety. There'll be no need to shut the gates. There'll be no night there. Verse 26. They'll bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. No, any, neither anyone that does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's not saying here that these people are still alive. They're alive, but they're in hell. It's just saying that this is going to be a place of absolute purity. I mean, no more sin. No more sinners. You know what makes work hard sometimes? Sinners. <laughs> For everybody with believers, work might be a little different place, but it's difficult living in this world. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So this river is flowing out of the throne. Uh, by the way, if you study Ezekiel, at the end of Ezekiel, during the millennial temple, he sees a river coming out of the temple, and it's going to actually turn the Dead Sea into fresh water, all except for the marshes and things like that. You can read that in the end of Ezekiel. There's other places you can read about the future as well, not just Revelation. There's other books in the Bible, Daniel, and other books that have glimpses into the future. Uh, most, Many of them are millennial passages, but yeah, Revelation is not the only place if you spend time in the Word and study it. So this river flows through the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river, the tree of life, that's singular, with its 12 kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit each month. So there's months in heaven. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will, some translations say worship, some say serve. Either one is good. Serve Him. Worship Him. We'll worship Him. We'll serve Him. Or we'll worship and serve God forever. What we'll be doing, I don't know, but... It's going to be good because it's perfect. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. Uh, they will not need the light of the lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And He said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent His angel to show his servants, not just John, us, to show his servant what must soon take place. Now, Jesus is going to repeat himself many times here. When God repeats himself, pay attention. I'm a seventh grade teacher for a profession. I repeat myself a lot. 
get out a pencil. Everybody needs a pencil on their desk. <laughs> if you don't have a pencil, borrow one from someone. When God repeats himself to us, why do you think he does that? Because we're, we're just like kids sometimes. We don't pay what? We don't let it sink in. We don't fully comprehend it. So when God repeats himself to us, especially in the scriptures, we better pay attention and let it sink in. Because sometimes I don't think we really believe what he says here when he says it's going to soon take place. Maybe pretty soon you'll be there and you're like, wow, that, I didn't expect it to happen that quick. Thought it'd be a long time. He's showing us that this is soon going to take place. God sees things in the spiritual realm different than we do. He does time different than we do. Well, you better believe him when he says it's soon going to take place. Let go of this world and focus on home. Live in the light of judgment day. Live in the light of the fact that you're going to be home soon. When your trials come, remember, you're going to be home soon. Jesus is coming back to this earth soon, he says. Verse 7, behold, he says it again, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So prophecy is just not so we can speculate about things and dream about things. It's about obedience. But there should be an obedience as a result of us reading Revelation. <laughs> it talks about judgment day. It talks about rewards. Verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. He does this twice, doesn't he? Here's a seasoned apostle, served God for years, walked with Jesus for three years, saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, falling down to worship an angel. <laughs> Some things our human bodies and human minds just can't comprehend. It just trips us out. And John falls down to worship this angel. He's so overwhelmed with what God has showed him. He's out of his mind. And the angel said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you. That's an interesting concept. The angels are fellow servants with us. They serve God. We serve God. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Some things were sealed up with a seal. We looked at that when we looked at the seven seals, but... He said, this is not to be sealed up. Let everybody know about it. Tell people about it. Tell the churches about it. For 2,000 years, we should be reading this, knowing this. Why? Because the time is what? Near. Verse 11, I never really understood until last night. Check it out. Let the evildoers still do evil, and let the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. I always get, that verse kind of bothered me because I was... Like, wait a minute, don't we want people to repent? Why would you tell the evildoer to keep doing evil? And the filthy to still be filthy, and the righteous to still be righteous. I mean, I can understand encouraging the righteous to still be righteous and the holy to still be holy, but why is he telling the evildoer to still do evil? It's not what he's saying. When I studied this passage, and I, and I got understanding from it from a guy from the 1800s, lots of great teachers out there, in his commentaries, from English guy, he said, this is God's final declaration of your eternal destiny. In other words, at this point, if you haven't repented yet, he's sealing your destiny. Understand? That if you are an evil person at this point, you will be evil forever. That's what he's saying. It's a, it's a declaration. Let the evil still be evil and let the righteous to be righteous. Now, if you're a righteous person, you will be a righteous and holy person forever. Do you have to work at righteousness and holiness now? You have to work out your salvation now? Yes, you do. But then, if you are righteous and holy, you will be righteous and holy forever. But if you are wicked and evil, you won't be annihilated. You'll exist. But you will always be filthy and you will always be evil for all eternity. That's what that verse is saying. Now, now those people will be in the lake of fire, but there will be no repentance for them. I talked to a guy one time. He kind of thought that maybe you could repent in hell. No, you can't. It's appointed for men to die once and then to face judgment. That's it. When your death is over. This is your chance to repent. This is our chance to turn. Uh, we need to repent too, right? As Christians, we need to be live holier lives. I love what Jonathan Edwards says. This week, Lord, let me grow higher in, in religion and my faith. What's your goal for the week? Is your goal for the week to grow higher in Christianity? Is your week, goal for the week to get closer to God by Saturday than you were today? Do you want to grow in your faith this week? Is that your goal? Is that your number one goal? Or is it just to get through the week? without having too many problems. So we can. 
The, the word says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're not done yet. There's more to know about God this week that you can know. There's more about his word to learn that you can learn this week. God wants to teach you. If you'll spend time in it, if you'll seek him. But this is the final declaration here. Let the evildoer be evil for eternity and the righteous be righteous for eternity. It's over. Verse 12. What does Jesus say again? Behold, I am coming soon. Bringing my reward with me. When will you get your full reward for your service here on earth? When he comes. When you die. He says, and I will repay each one for what he has done. What you do here, like I said last week, is so important. It matters. What you do here matters. Because he's going to reward you for it. He doesn't, you know, people might not notice what you do. They may not notice your prayers. They may not notice your giving. They may not notice your service. But Jesus notices it. He notices when you choose to not sin and you choose to pray instead of sin. He notices when you choose to go to the Word. He notices everything you do. And He's going to reward you for it. And like I said last week, He is perfectly capable of giving you an awesome reward. Because He's an awesome God. You won't get your full reward here on earth. I know that I understand that as a school teacher. I really kind of understand that as a minister too. You won't get your full reward here on earth, but you will one day, and it's going to be better than you imagine. And what you do here matters. It matters. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. How do you wash your robe? And the blood of the Lamb, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by, its, by the gates. How are you going into the city? By the gates. Outside are the dogs. Oh, there it is right there. No dogs in heaven. No, it's not talking about those type of dogs. In the ancient Near East, dogs were kind of like what we would say rats or something like that. They, were, they weren't pets. You didn't have a pet dog in that time period. Dogs were like these scavengers that were filthy and had disease, and they'd come in and eat things, and they'd attack, and they'd, they were just... They're wild, and they, they weren't domesticated, and they weren't pets. And so when they referred in the Bible to a dog, like I think it was Abner, one of the leaders of Israel's army, he said, am I a dog's head? You know, it's like the worst thing you can be is a dog's head. Um, so th these dogs are compared to unbelievers who are not living in obedience to God. Outside of the dogs, the sorcerers, the fornicators, sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Plural. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's the church, says, come, Lord Jesus, come. And let the one who here says, come. And let who the one who is thirsty come. Let him let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price come. So look, here, even at the end, Jesus is inviting people. Even in the last chapter of Revelation, He's inviting people right now who are reading this book for the last 2,000 years. Come to me. Come drink. It doesn't cost anything. It's free water. Does it cost you anything to have a quiet time? Do you have to pay anything to open your Bible? Come, come to the Lord. Come drink. Here's the invitation going out. What is our job to get the invitation out with him? To invite people to church. Come to church. Come to the Lord. Go to the Lord. It's good. He's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Spirit and the Bride are saying, Come, Lord Jesus. And, there's, he's, and then God is calling the people to come. Even now, the invitation is still open. This is not closed yet. He said, Whoever, whoever is thirsty, whoever, anyone can come. If you go to hell, it's going to be on you. You didn't come. He was inviting you. He was calling you. I love that. One last invitation as you're reading the Scriptures. Scriptures closing out with an invitation for people to come to Him. He wants you to come to Him. Then a warning. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Have you read the plagues in this book? Woo. I don't want them anything added to that. So John, as he's writing this, is concerned that this thing might get corrupted. That's, people might add some things into it and put some other strange things in there, you know. And John's, John's basically saying, you know, if you do this, you're going to be cursed by God if you mess with his scriptures. If you mess with this book. Is there, are there false religions out there that mess with the scriptures? If anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, 
God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city. That means you're not going to heaven. That means, oh, you can just eat the fruit every now and then. You're a Christian, but you can eat. No, he's saying that if you take away from the, you ignore this. You don't, you change it up. You, you become a false teacher. You're not going to enter the city. You're going to be in the lake of fire. The deepest darkness is reserved for false teachers. Well, some of them stand in pulpits every Sunday or on stages every Sunday, but they twist the word. And he's going to take away your share in the tree of life and the holy city, which is described in his book, if you mess with the word of God. Woo, that's one thing I wouldn't want to mess with. You don't want to mess with the bride of Christ? You don't. I know people that are dead because they mess with the bride of Christ. I'll tell you straight up. I know. I saw, I saw them die because they mess with the bride of Christ. It was their church. Well, it ain't your church. Most ministers can testify to that. I've seen that. Don't mess with the Lord's church and don't mess with his word. Don't twist his word. Boy, if you're going to teach and preach his word, you better know what you're talking about. He who testifies to these things says, <laughs> what does he say? Surely I am coming soon. Has it sunk in yet? Do you believe it yet? Our minds say, eh, yeah, I kind of understand, but not really. It may be a long time. <laughs> Surely I am coming soon. So why should this encourage us? Because it's going to happen soon. And when you see me in heaven, you see me inside those gates, I'm looking forward to not only hugging Jesus, meeting some of these people in the Bible, but also seeing my grandparents inside the gates. You know, you all know which gate you're coming through. I'm looking forward to seeing them there. This is heaven coming down to earth, but... This is not us going up to them. It's him coming down to us, right? In our new earth. This is after the millennium. This is, there's some wonderful things in the scriptures about our future. The study and read. Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Can you say that today? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. This, I let go of this world. Whatever I've been holding to in my mind and my heart that I foolishly think is going to be better than your coming, let it go. Come, Lord Jesus. You know, when someone dies, we grieve. It's why one of the worst things that can happen to us on this earth. It is. It's horrible. Death is horrible. We grieve. That separation, that pain is horrible. It takes months, years. Sometimes you never get over it on this earth. But that person who dies, they don't grieve anymore. We should be happy for them. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Wonderful promise. If you'll do that today, you get some spare time at home, draw near to God, what's He going to do? Draw near to you. He matches you step by step. He may even do two for one. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. People are important to God. He, he, value, he values people. And one of my prayers for like my students is, Lord, help me see them through your eyes. Help me see them with your heart. Let me feel about them the way you feel about them. We make it about ourselves so much. Now, check this out. I didn't read the last verse, but this is, a, this is an interesting ending. Okay, it's, it's a way that way we end a lot, of our, a lot of the Bible, New Testament verses, that the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, John says. Amen. Hey, like you said, we all need grace. You know why you need grace? Because you're still a sinner. I'm a sinner. We got two kinds of sin in us, sins that we actually know we're doing. I shouldn't do this, and I do it anyway. And we got sins, according to the Scripture, that we don't even know are sins that we're doing. Did you know that? attitudes, ways you respond to things. We are sinners. So we need grace. And yes, we need to be a, a people that show one another grace because maybe God has revealed something to you and he's worked on you in an area, but maybe someone who's just believer a couple years, they, they need some grace. And we all need to give grace to people. Everyone's in a different part of their journey. I've been walking with the Lord a long time. Sometimes I need to give grace to my students, a lot of grace to my students. We need to give grace to one another because we've been given grace and we need grace. And John closes this out. Yeah, you've got a good future coming. The world's going to be horrible at the end, but God's going to make it all right new and we're going to live with Him forever. Here's a little glimpse of it. But until then, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And I'm glad for His grace. A lot of, a lot of our lessons in life are just learning forgiveness, forgiving people, loving people in, in spite of how they hurt us, responding appropriately to when people mistreat us or... Or rude to us, or disrespectful to us, or whatever, or judgmental of us. We have to respond. And that's part of the test, the trial. you got to learn to respond appropriately here. So you may be going to keep getting some of this stuff until you learn and forgive and respond appropriately and love and pray. And whenever someone hurts you, that's a prayer request, right? Jesus said, pray for those who harm you or persecute you. So you got to put that person on your... Maybe that person needs prayer. 
That's why they're hurting you. They're hurting themselves. So let's put them on the prayer list and let's intercede for them and pray for them. Not so that they won't attack us anymore, but just because that's what we're supposed to be doing. If we're going to be his children, we got to be praying for people. Amen. You, you know, you don't want to live your life frustrated, angry, impatient, upset. You want God to shine those, his light on those emotions, recognize the sin that's causing them, and get rid of it, right? He doesn't want us to live like that every day. So when I start to feel a little frustrated, I'm angry or whatever, then, hey, what's causing this? What, why are you angry? I was reading Jonah the other night, it was twice the other day, uh, do you have a right to be angry? I do! No, you don't. You're not giving grace. There should be things that do bother you. I mean, honestly, there should be things that do bother you, that, especially if someone treats someone else disrespectful in front of you. Uh, I had a friend who, uh, a deacon came up, and it's another church, a deacon came up to the pastor and just blasted him right after the service. And the pastor just lost his best friend that last week. The devil has perfect timing, right? And the deacon did this, you know, and that, my friend was lit angry. He said, I was, I was, I cannot talk to that man right now because I am. You, I mean, shit, those things should bother you. If they don't bother you, people being insulted, people being harmed, yeah. people being disrespected, that's just, you know, something wrong with you. You don't, things that don't bother you. All right, so y'all, this week, hey, let's talk about spiritual disciplines before we go. This week, what are you going to do about the Word this week? How many chapters of the Bible are you going to read every day? Think about it. Pray about it. Not, not so you can just make yourself miserable when you don't, okay? But so you can grow spiritually. You know, say you, you say, I'm going to read two chapters a day. I feel like the Lord leading me to read two, two chapters a day. And you do it five days. Hey, you just read ten chapters that you probably wouldn't have read if, unless you'd had that discipline, right? So some spiritual disciplines that help you grow in your faith this week. What are you going to do with the Word of God this week? Don't just leave it collecting dust. Spend time in it in your quiet time. Spend time in it with your cup of coffee. You know, read through different books of the Bible. Read through them. You're not going to get something out of every verse, but as you read through, you will see patterns. You will see God reveal Himself to you. You will understand who God is. So what are you going to do with the Word this week? How many chapters are you going to read this week? And then, what about prayer? Are you going to spend some time, set aside some time to intercede for people, for one another, uh, to battle for people? Are we going to, we're going to make that a priority to, even if it's just 15 minutes, to set aside that every day? I'm going to pray and intercede during this time. Because I tell you what, if you're like me, it gets crowded out. We are busy people, and we're busy people by choice. I'll say it again. We're busy people by choice. Sometimes you just need to be merry and sit at the Lord's feet. And that's the best thing you can do instead of being distracted and upset and busy. Be a merry to sit at the Lord's feet rest let him minister to you let jesus teach you through his word let him speak to you it will be great for your soul work will be better everything will probably be better because you spent time at the lord's feet because you'll be changed your soul will be fed you'll be strengthened we're too busy and we make ourselves busy think about that this week let's grow higher and closer to the lord father thank you for our wonderful time together thank you for your wonderful word bless us as we go to worship now Help us to not be distracted. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord God. And help us to bless one another by listening to one another, talking to one another, listening to people out there, greeting people out there. Uh, bless our lunch time, our fellowship time. All this is important, Lord. Help us to obey the one another commands. Get our eyes off ourselves and on who we should be ministering to today. And keep our eyes on you, Lord Jesus, as we seek to hear your word, to worship you together. And to just draw near to you today. Thank you for Sundays. Thank you for the gift of this place. Bless our pastor. Bless the worship leaders. Strengthen us. Give us your presence, Lord God. We want to be near you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time. Hope y'all have a great week.